why have eyewitnesses gotten such a bad rep lately? What, uh, I, maybe for a long time now. What's wrong with an eyewitness? Says, I saw him attack me. I'll never forget that face. So I took a class in law school uh, called Wrongful Convictions, and part of that class tested eyewitnesses. And what it did was it showed a video of a crime scene happening from the perspective of the onlooker and about the timing that you would have to ordinary, ordinarily see the faces and the, you know, how far away you would be and uh, things like that. And we watched the video, and then we watched it again, and then we watched it again. You never get to see reality happen three times before you over and over again, but we got to. And then we had a lineup of people, uh, one through six, and we were asked to identify the perpetrator who we had just seen, right? And remember, normally there's a big time lapse between when you actually see a crime and come in. And we were asked to then vote on who was the person in the lineup. And a class of people who were intensely watching, knowing we're about to watch a lineup, divided almost equally between the six perpetrators. <laughs> and the person wasn't in the lineup. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my god. And you know, it's the limitations of perception and memory and different uh, perceptions, individuals' ability to actually watch, discriminate, and know what's happening. So you know, if, if I am absolutely certain I saw something, chances are I might be wrong, and the chances are pretty high that I be, might be wrong. When, when the police show you a lineup, do they, do they ever say the, um, the suspect may or may not be among these people? There are, there are very detailed instructions about ways to try to decrease bias in lineups, including, for example, trying to have people who are roughly the same height and, and wearing roughly the same type of clothing and yeah. not having, you know, five people who are in a green shirt and one person who you think is a suspect in a red shirt, right? <laughs> and, and like, we laugh, but many lineups did a lot of these types of rigged activities. Or for example, and this is where a lot of the research that I think um, Anthony's doing is incredibly important, they'll show a picture lineup first and you'll identify the suspect, so you'll have been primed by actually seeing a photograph of who you think that person is. And then you see a lineup where the person who you thought, but none of the other people in the pictures are in the lineup. And now all of a sudden you say, oh, I remember that person. Because you're remembering the picture. You may be. Yeah, could be. Now, the, the test that you did with Anthony yeah. uh, is related to this, I think, right? Because this, would, this sounds to me, correct me if I'm wrong, sounds as though you were testing her for whether or not she recognized the face, even if she wasn't able consciously to say, that's the face I recognize. So we have done that experiment. We, we did not do that one with Nita, but, uh. but we, did, we did a variant of that with Nita. And so what um, Nita experienced and others uh, in our lab have experienced is we bring them in and we show them very simple stimuli, isolated faces, so not the kind of events that you might be probing for, for a real world sort of crime or legally relevant sort of event. But they're seeing individual events one at a time during the study period, and then we place them in the scanner, and we show them the faces that they saw during the study period, and we show them novel faces, and we have them make memory decisions, both when they're cooperating and when Nita and others were not cooperating, right, trying to beat the system. And what we um, wanted to know is, well, by looking at their patterns of brain activity, when subjects are seeing old faces and new faces, can we know which faces the subject is recognizing, perceiving as old, which uh, uh, is the subject perceiving as new? So and we do quite well there. You do, no, but you're not, you're not uh, recognizing a pattern related to a face but a pattern related to recognizing a face. That's critical. Not necessarily, are, is a, so if I could, not, not necessarily uh, is it a pattern that's related to having encountered that face before. It's a pattern of activity related to the experience of thinking you encountered the face before. Oh, so oh not even real recognition, just, not just a sense of familiarity. Patterns of brain activity for true recognition and false recognition. There are small differences between them that distinguish uh -huh. them, but they're very, very similar. So we can re use brain imaging with pr pretty high accuracy to know whether or not you are having the experience of recognizing that stimulus, that face, but not whether or not you have true memory or false memory. What were you studying with Nita? What was the point of that? We did, we did that. 
uh, very experiment is the first part, and that's uh -huh. where we, we could, I could report out that we were somewhere in the mid-70s in terms of our, our, our accuracy in detecting memories in Nita's brain versus not. And then in the second part of the experiment, we had her try to beat the system. She engaged countermeasures, and we fell the chance. Right. In a prior experiment, though, r that set up the study that we uh, did with Nita, we asked the very question that you, you posed, which is, can you look at brain patterns uh, where uh, that are uh, associated with two different kinds of states. One, where the subject does not recognize the face as having been encountered, and the face was old, and the subject doesn't recognize the face that was enc uh, as encountered, and the face was new. That is, when the person doesn't have this, the mental experience of recognizing the face, can we detect what they actually encountered versus not? And there we were very, very close to chance. Close so to chance. Very close so to chance. We not, were not so below 60%. Yeah. Um, we know from decades of uh, research now that there are these non-conscious memory traces, these implicit memories that are shaping our behavior all the time, how quickly I can perceive your face. The words that I'm producing are primed and, and coming to mind based on my recent experience, even though I'm, I'm unaware that I'm being shaped by my recent experience. We know that this kind of learning that uh, occurs and is expressed outside of conscious awareness depends upon our cortex. We thought we'd be able to, and, and we know that in fact with brain imaging you can see small changes in the strength of the, uh, of the activity related to old versus new items, even when people are unaware. We thought we'd be able to leverage that to read out and be able to do accurate classification or accurate detection of whether or not Nita had encountered the face versus not, or our subjects had encountered a face versus not when they weren't aware. But we just, it, right now, where the technology is, is it, so it performed sounds, quite it poorly. It sounds to me like the, the work that's being done is extraordinary in tracking what goes on in the brain during these moments of recognition, of lying, and that kind of thing. But it sounds like we're not terribly close to being able to use these things with assurance in the courtroom? Probably not. I mean, there, there have been a few attempts already to introduce this kind of information into criminal cases, and they haven't made it past the first stage, which is scientific admissibility. So yeah. there have been some evidentiary hearings. Anthony, in fact, testified at one of them about whether or not we've reached a level of scientific certainty or scientific acceptability of information to admit it into the courtroom.